Thank you. Great. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Um, where am I? Okay. We'll do the minutes after, Joanne, if that's okay. Sure, sure, okay. sure. Great. So first um, off, I'd like to formally introduce our two guests tonight, because I, I know you know, you've heard of them, you might have seen them in passing, you might have met them at the clinic, but I want to formally introduce our two public health nurses. We have on the top corner, Kate Kelly, and Kate started with us uh, November 1st, I believe, of last year. And she's been, her full-time job primarily has been running the clinics. And then we have Vivian Franklin, who started with me, I think a year ago, April, Viv, is that about right? As a contractor, you're on mute. Mm -hmm. End of March, beginning of April. March, okay, right. Um, we yeah. hired her as a con one of our contact tracers. Uh, she was a contracted position and then um, moved into a budgeted full-time position. So both of them are part of um, the health department's PNS and moving forward, we are gonna have two full-time public health nurses. So um, if you guys wanna introduce yourselves really quickly, have, just in case you haven't met the board members, we'll start with Suzanne Smith. Oh, oh, we're introducing ourselves. Yeah, do you oh, mind? Okay. And then we'll, come, we'll bring it home with uh, Kate and Vivian. Okay, I'm a physician. I practice addiction medicine. And I have a long history. <laughs> You've been on the board how long? 13, more than 13 years. Woo! And she'll stay on the board until I retire. <laughs> I've been told. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Cynthia? Yep, I'm Cynthia Swopis. Um, I'm very bad at um, old maid. I've known Kate for decades. And um, I teach it, well, I'm retired from UMass, but I still teach a health course there. So Vivian, so nice to have you with us. And Kate, always great to have you with us. Lauren? Oh, hi. I know, uh, I know Kate Kelly. We've, we've talked at the, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to meet you. I'm, uh, I've been on the board for three years. Uh, in real life, I am a pollution, groundwater pollution engineer. I do a lot of radon, vapor intrusion, and exposure work as well. All right, and then I know you both know the chair of the Board of Health, Dr. Levin. Yep, we've crossed paths a few times <laughs> <laughs> over the past pandemic. Um, but I'm so glad that uh, you'll be official and, uh, you know, sort of more permanent fixture around the uh, Department of Health. And um, it's been great working with you. Great. Now, Kate, can you give us a little bit of your background? A little summary? Hi, everyone. So it's been a pleasure to meet. I've met everyone at this point, I think, luckily over here um, at the Senior Center. Um, I, uh, um, I've been here since November. Prior to that, I worked for a few months as a school nurse, and prior to that, seven years as a pediatric nurse practitioner in primary care. And for 10 years prior to nursing school, I worked with people like Cindy for five years doing tobacco control and five years doing pandemic preparedness um, at every level from local board of health to coalition state DPH. So a little bit of public health, a little bit of nursing, and now they're getting combined. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Kate, if I remember correctly, didn't you come and do a presentation with Jenny on vaccines a couple years ago? Mm. Probably. You came to our board of health <laughs> meeting. <laughs> oh, is that I memorable? Mean, <laughs> I've been known to speak at public comment at a lot of meetings. I know I came and spoke during the whole make downtown smoke free thing. And I might have, I've been known to talk about vaccines too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kate. Viv? Hi, I'm Vivian. Let's see. Um, I've been doing the clinics and also doing a lot of other public health nursing things, a lot of the COVID management and contact tracing and then management of other infectious diseases such as tuberculosis as well. Um, and informing policies around COVID-19. So it's been a very busy year. Um, prior to this, I had kind of an eclectic background in both healthcare and in education. So a lot of um, pre-K education and special education were my areas of focus. She's also an amazing artist. You should ask oh. her about it sometime. Oh, <laughs> yes. 
I illustrated a book. It's out now. You can buy it, but um, I'm not officially advertising it here. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Thank you, guys. So I asked Vivian and Kate to join us tonight so they can kind of um, give us an overview of A, the vaccine clinic, which Kate has primarily been running, and then Viv is our data and demo girl, and to give us um, some statistics uh, locally, countywide, statewide, where we're at with vaccines. All right. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully that doesn't disrupt the whole thing here. So let's try this and see if it works. Who's District 29? I just admitted them. All right, let me see. Can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. With the presentation on it, correct? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. So um, we just did the slides to help us stay organized and make sure we weren't repeating each other. Um, and so forgive me a little bit, please, because my slides are not all that interesting to look at. But uh, just a quick overview, which I think most of you are familiar with from having been over here, but we've been operating at the Senior Center since January 11th. Um, Vivian and I did a tally today before we were done with today's clinic, which only ended about a half hour ago. So um, these are not perfect numbers, but they're very, very close. We've given um, almost 2000 Moderna doses, 20, over 28,000 Pfizer doses, and then um, over 1300 J&J doses um, to date and a little bit more Pfizer and J&J &J today. Um, as you know, um, Meredith applied for the regional co collaboration. And so we've been working with Amherst um, ever since February um, and have been running separate clinics, but still um, collaborative, um, talking to each other every week and lessons learned and so forth. Um, we figured out that the maximum number of shots we ever gave in one day at the senior center was 938. I suspect the minimum we've ever given at the senior center is probably about 38. The day that we had the major um, drop off uh, unexpectedly, it was a day we were planning to go from 120 an hour up to 168 an hour and 30 something people showed up. So it's a big range, um, and, but the 938 days were pretty awesome and exciting. Um, and then over 31,000 shots so far as of this morning. Um, we've collaborated with some other Western Mass cities and towns. Um, East Hampton did uh, some clinics for their 12 and up population. Um, we've been sharing vaccine with East Long Meadow as well as West Springfield. Oh, I can't click ahead. Thank you. As you know, we followed all the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and CDC guidelines for the distribution timeline, which had its challenges for sure. Um, the public was very, very stressed about the vaccine, particularly at the beginning. Um, we followed all of the vaccine hand handling and storage guidelines from the CDC and the manufacturers and obviously the vaccine administration protocols. And I feel like it was all quite successful in the end. I made a list that's not exhaustive of all the people that I could think of who we've collaborated with, um, mostly at the senior center. Um, and uh, this is not probably everyone. Meredith can probably add some folks to this, but it's a pretty nice, awesome list of, I think, a really great collaboration over here at this building. Um, let's see. Uh, next. Sorry, I'm not used to <laughs> having to say next. Um, Meredith asked me to share with you a little bit about what else we've been doing outside of this building. Um, so ever since the very first few weeks that we received the vaccine, we started collaborating with Dr. Jess Bassi, who um, is from Healthcare Services for the Homeless, which is out of Springfield, but she has clinic two days a week in Northampton at the Cot Shelter. Um, and we started taking vaccine on the road over to the Cot Shelter uh, Clinic and to the MANA Community Meals at St. John's once a month. Um, since February, which was very successful. We saw folks go from, you know, just a couple of very hesitant folks each month, more and more and more people. We did some pop-ups with her on the same day outside the congregate care. There's three different buildings with um, SRO uh, documentee up in Florence. And so we did several clinics outdoors up there and, um, and she, Dr. Bossi herself did some homebound visits for people who otherwise we wouldn't have been able to reach. She sort of sought them out and went directly to their homes during the clinics. 
Um, we've also been doing some other targeted clinics, um, both here at the senior center and offsite. So we had our first two walk-in clinics um, were scheduled in May and they were really aimed at back of the house restaurant workers. Um, Meredith and Vivian and Jenny had shared that in the past, you know, the real way they were able to get flu shots to people was just to bring them literally to the restaurants, to the kitchens. And so we invited them here for a walk-in clinic that was um, no ID required. We made it really clear it was free and that they didn't need to have health insurance. And those were our first two walk-in clinics before walk-in clinics were really as big as they are now. Um, we've been doing some shift workers. We just did two clinics over at the Coca-Cola plant, um, doing uh, showing up there uh, at the shift changes two days in a row to catch four separate groups of workers there. Um, and there's definitely some hesitancy over there, mostly people who wouldn't have gotten it if we didn't actually show up where they work and also wouldn't have made an appointment where they felt like they were committing, they wanted to talk to the nurses first before they got their shot. So that's been interesting. We'll be back there in three weeks. We, for example, one day we only had four people signed up, but about a dozen actually came out and talked to us and ended up signing up for a shot. Um, we've also been trying to keep our eye on residents at some of the local nursing facilities who were initially all vaccinated in December and January as part of that very, very first wave, but it turned out that they were um, you know, some people were not admitted yet. They were at home or homebound or for whatever reason now are being admitted and haven't been vaccinated. So we've done a handful of residents over at CARE One. Um, and today for the first time, we were able to go over to the Highview Nursing Facility um, and do give some vaccines there for folks who have kind of slipped through the cracks. We can move on. Um, just to give you a sense, some of the other pop-up and what I call vaccine on the road projects that we've done have been in Pulaski Park. We've done that weekly for, uh, I think, about six weeks now. Um, we've been going outside Northampton High. That There's a big white tent that they've agreed to leave out there as long as we feel it's needed. There's a giant parking lot, so that's been really good. Those two sites are now on the state VaxFinder site as well as our city website. Um, so that we can really try to catch anybody in the county who still needs their first dose or their second dose or either one. And I typically for those sites will also bring the Janssen vaccine so that people have that option. The same was true at Coca-Cola. Um, and we've gone now twice for first and second doses to um, two of the Northampton Housing Authority complexes. We've been doing homebound visits as they come up. We did a day of them at one point. Um, we it's kind of surprising. We actually haven't had that many requests, um, even after trying to fly our meals on wheels. But anytime we get a request, we fulfill it. Um, and then we're doing some downtown sort of walking shots, as I think of them, that are kind of hard to put another name on. They're basically, we have five doses left. Let's call the back of the house kitchen workers and see if any of them haven't made it over yet. I think we've done at least, I don't know, half the kitchen staff on one side of Main Street by doing that um, one night. We, they did like a total of probably eight shots at Vera Perzana and um, Fitzwillies, both uh, two different types of vaccine. And we've done that quite a few times. I'll literally walk down Main Street to the steps of City Hall and see if any of the folks hanging out there in the evening need a shot, which actually is successful. I mean, we've headed out and about to other Main Streets or events to try to drum up um, folks who might've been missed. And then we are in the middle of a two-part clinic at a um, Stanton Hall in Huntington, Mass, which is a collaboration with Hilltown Community Health Centers who have been receiving Moderna vaccine, but they had not had access to Pfizer vaccine. And so they wanted to do clinics for families, especially kids and, and parents, um, the kids being 12 and up who may not have had access to Pfizer yet. So we'll do second doses there a week from Saturday. Um, next. We're looking to go to Meadowbrook, hopefully. It's been a little stop and start with trying to organize something there. Same with Lumberyard, but I do think I have an in now that I can work with Grow Food. They're going back to those places weekly. Um, Meredith had asked me to look into working with Chart Pack. I've sent them a couple emails and phone messages, but they're still kind of on the back burner because um, they didn't get back to me yet, but not, well, not giving up. Um, and then moving forward, we so we'll be wrapping up here at the Senior Center in two weeks. We only have two clinics left here. Um, and I plan to do, um, just use the City Hall Chambers as kind of a large space where we can still have some distancing to clean up some of the second doses and still have the ability to offer first doses. 
Um, we're just seeing sort of a slow stream now. So that room um, would be a really nice place to offer that right downtown. So the folks who got their first doses today were offered appointments there or Pulaski Park in three weeks. Um, we haven't decided yet for how long we're gonna continue going to Northampton High School. Uh, I will continue to work with Dr. Bassi if she has people who still need vaccine. Um, and we are still going to serve any homebound folks who call and be creative with other ideas that come up. And then, um, so what we have left for vaccine, I just thought uh, just out of interest because the last two weeks, the state sent us vaccine, they sent us extra and that was right when the drop off happened. So we currently have a couple thousand doses of Pfizer still in our possession. Some of them um, we partnered with Smith College and they were able to give us an ultra cold freezer where the vaccine is negative 81 Celsius. So um, we're able to hang on to that a little extra. Um, I still have some Janssen in the fridge here and they keep extending the expiration date, which is terrific. Um, just this week, they extended it to August so I can keep bringing it around with me. And then um, this is just a list of the places we hope to keep going in the summer. I think I might've put that list in twice by mistake. Sorry about that. And then all the appointments, should anyone ask you? It's all the information is on the city of Northampton website. If you click on info and appointments and also it's um, some of these sites that are regular like city hall chamber or city council chambers in Pulaski Park are on VaxFinder. Okay, now we get into the fun data bit of this presentation. All right, so this is the demographic breakdown of our data at our clinics. Um, not surprisingly, it sort of mimics the data that we're seeing in Massachusetts. Can I, um, can I interrupt? Would yeah. you press the button to uh, put a, um, at the bottom? If you go all the way to the bottom, it's just to get a little bigger. Yes, perfect. Oh, can everybody see that? Okay. I would, you know what? I was nervous about pressing too many buttons because I didn't <laughs> want a technical fiasco in the middle of the presentation. <laughs> It's, okay. just a, it's just a board of health meeting. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this is a demographic breakdown of our data here for our clinics. Like I said, it sort of mimics the data that we're seeing in the state. Largely, um, a lot of the majority of the vaccines are going to the older populations. I'm hopeful that that will start shifting and our more of our younger populations will start seeking the vaccine more. Um, not surprisingly, also, a lot of our vaccines are going to the white non-Hispanic population. There's been a lot of um, drive statewide, nationwide, and locally to get more minority groups vaccinated as well. Um, and it's actually, the reasons behind that are pretty nuanced, but among them are, you know, lack of access, um, lack of targeted public health messaging at the beginning, but we are, you know, working locally and statewide to fix that. Um, interestingly, more Females than males um, have been getting vaccinated at our site. Um, and I'll go into how this is reflected in Northampton data um, after this. But yeah, so um, I'm happy to um, email these slides out if you want access to this data a little bit more. And then you can also find um, municipal and statewide data is available through mass.gov, but this is the data for our site. All right, and then this is the Northampton vaccination rate and rates and unsurprisingly, it sort of looks very similar to what we're seeing at our site. Um, we did see a huge um, uptake of vaccine in our 12 to 15 year olds as soon as they became eligible. They've quickly surpassed um, their 16 to 19 year old friends. So there's some catch up that has to happen there. Um, we, you do see that you know more females are being are contributing to a, um, a greater proportion of vaccinations than males in Northampton, but it's important to also look at the fact that females also contribute to a greater greater proportion of our total population too. So if you look at vaccination rates, they're actually relatively equal between both sexes. And then we also have our race and ethnicity data here. Um, as we saw with our clinic vaccination rates, our white non-Hispanic population is getting vaccinated at a higher rate. Um, but you know, our minority groups are catching up a bit. Viv. Yes. Am I seeing when I'm looking vaccine distribution by age group, mm. 65 and older, both groups are above the 90%. Is that what that is? So yes. Um, above 90%. So our 
and I apologize. It's a little bit tiny there. I did try to make it a little bit. No, that's okay. But, um, I just wanted to make sure I was seeing yeah, that. So those two older groups, so our 65 to 70 year olds and our 75 and older group are not over 90% of them in Northampton are fully vaccinated at this point. And there is wow. a community of them that are partially vaccinated. Um, I should note too, these graphs are current as of um, June 8th. Unfortunately, the data for this week didn't update until 5 p.m. I didn't have enough time to make new graphs, but I expect there to be um, a greater shift tonight over to the fully vaccinated proportion of folks. Beautiful. Oh, if you want to ask me any questions about the data, I will happily um, nerd out over that a little bit can with I, you. Can I ask you um, a question? So, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> can you go back? <laughs> Do you know how that compares those two age groups to the state's vaccination rates? The older age groups? Yeah. The no, the older. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty reflective of what we're seeing in the state and in actually the country, but um, that would wow. be if you would like, I can look, delve into that a little bit further for you after the meeting. Okay, I was just curious. Okay, thank you. But I think statewide, those two age groups have um, been you know, above a 90% rate for being fully vaccinated. That's phenomenal. Yeah. I'd have to verify that, but I'm, I think that's what I recall. So speaking of comparisons and vaccination rates, here we go. Um, Northampton is doing exceptionally well. Um, you can compare us right here to Hampshire County, Massachusetts, and I threw in the United States for a little bit of flair. So we have 74% of our population. And this data is actually, I was able to update that. So this data for Northampton is current um, as of the 15th. So 74% of our population already has um, one or more doses. That's 81% of our eligible population. So 81% of our population who's 12 years of age or older has one dose at least. So 64% of our total population is fully vaccinated now. And that makes 70% of our eligible population is fully vaccinated now, which is really exciting. Um, in Hampshire County, if we wanna compare, 61% of our total population in Hampshire County has at least one dose. 67% have of our eligible population have at least one dose. Um, and then I asterisk these two numbers here because I did not have enough time to calculate that before our meeting tonight, I apologize. But as of 6-8, as of June 8th, 51% of our total population in Hampshire County had at least one dose and that's 56% of our total eligible population. And then we compare with Massachusetts you can see the numbers right here. Um, I'm happy to read through them though. 65% um, of our total population in Massachusetts has at least one dose. That's 74% of the eligible population. 57% um, of our total population are fully vaccinated now and that's 66% of the eligible population. And actually I was pleasantly surprised by the data for the United States. Obviously it's gonna be dependent on where you live in the country, but um, as of, the 15th, 51% of our total population, according to the CDC, is fully vaccinated. Um, that total population, that's our eligible population, excuse me. Any you questions have, about that? Done, you guys have done just an amazing, amazing job. I really think, um, I, I'm a little curious about how you do the outreach clinics, because in the beginning, there was all this talk about how delicate the vaccines were, they couldn't be transported. And like, so what are the rules around that? And how physically, how do you do it? You walk around with a little cooler or what happens? Yeah, so at the beginning, it was really scary to think about moving the vaccine even multiple times in the building. Um, and I was sort of joking today that I can, I can be a part of an effort to do 120 people an hour. And I can be really good at doing a table where we do 10. I'm not sure how I would feel about something in the middle where I had to transport many vials more than once, but typically what we do is we take the vials directly from the senior center to wherever we're going, and um, we have a lot of squishy um, cold packs and a really fancy cooler from the um, Emergency Preparedness Coalition that is supposed to be good enough to put a data logger just like you would on a refrigerator um, for a vaccine. 
Um, it, it actually keeps things quite cool, but I like to pack the vials in the squishy, like with those squishy cold packs, one on top of the other. So there's no chance of it wiggling or rolling. Um, and then keep it as cold as possible, keep the whole cooler in the shade. And then if I have two different things going on, I will come back to this building and get the vaccine for the other clinic. I think only one time have we actually transported a vial from one place to another, again, in those cold packs, but it was because the, the high school was more popular than the site that I was at. So then they, they ran out and I have the keys to the senior center. So it just worked out for them to come take that vial since it was already technically out of the fridge. But most of the time we're just really careful. Um, I guess, so I say we go up and down Main Street. There is one day I literally did just pull my car up in front of um, City Hall and opened the back and like gave and had vaccine in the cooler and asked, does anybody need a shot? But most of the time what we do is we actually walk up the street and back again. We go take turns and just ask people, do you need a shot? We're down in Pulaski Park. So we're not actually walking around with the vaccine in our hands or the shots in our hands. We're inviting them to walk down the street to us. Um, and for the homebound, similarly, we've learned that little sandwich containers, I've got a million of them around here, just those little, they call them um, throwaway, but they're reusable sandwich bins that are about this big, they fit a syringe perfectly diagonally so that it can't really roll, and then we put a alcohol wipes and band-aids and gauze in that and make a little to-go kit when we're going into one person's house, and usually whoever's doing that goes directly from here to that person's house. I also, we had a volunteer um, who is a professor of pharmacy at Western New England um, University, and she had been involved in going out from Walgreens. She also works at Walgreens, and she had been involved in going out to the um, nursing homes back in December and January. So I picked her brain a lot about where did you draw it up? How did you move it? Um, and most of the time we try to transport the vials not drawn up so that there's no chance for the syringes to get bumped. But if we're going to a single person, we'll draw it up and, and position it in a little container and put a cover on it. Kate, are you using J&J &J for the vaccine on the road efforts? Sometimes, yeah. So like yesterday we went to, yesterday and the day before we went to Coca-Cola and we had advertised it as Pfizer because the, the outdates of the Janssen have been questionable and I would have had it available, originally I would have had it available this week, but it would have outdated by the next time I was there. So I didn't want to say we were going to have it and then not have it the second time. In the meantime, they extended the date. So I brought it with me and offered it and I used a whole vial of it yesterday. Okay. Um, but usually when we're in Pulaski Park, what I'll do honestly is pack them up as well as I can and open whatever the first thing we're asked for is, and then see what happens as people come and try to use up, not waste anything. I mean, for months and months and months, we didn't waste one single dose. And now we're at the point of where the state is saying, you know, if you're going to open a vial because you have four people open the vial. Um, so um, anyway, so I will take it, I'm taking it to particular places. I haven't, I only took it to the high school once when I knew there was someone who wanted it, who could meet us there. Um, because typically the demand there has been for the Pfizer, for siblings or what have you. And Vivian, I had a question about um, Hampshire County. Yeah. I imagine that the distribution in Hampshire County reflects somewhat the distribution nationally, which is where you have areas of strong penetration of the vaccine, and then you have um, vaccine islands of uh, low uptake. Can you tell us a little bit about where the areas are where the uptake of vaccine is lower in the county? Yeah, I would be able to tell you that, um, except my screen is being shared right now. If we don't want- I can tell you actually, Amherst yeah. has one of the lowest vaccination rates in the state of Massachusetts. Mm. You told us that last month, and I still don't believe it. But Babe, can you bring it up? I, I mean, yeah. that's just incomprehensible. Hold on, I'm just going to stop sharing momentarily, and then yeah. I'll have that data. Yes. You can stop sharing now. It was in the news um, also, Suzanne, which it's alarming. I don't know why it is, especially considering at first I thought it was the student population at UMass, but now that they're all required to have vaccines to return to school, um, this coming year might have changed, but a month ago they were the one of the lowest communities in the state of Massachusetts. 
Is there any speculation? I think that it could have to do with they got their first, but then they didn't get their second, and we don't know where they put their residence was. Like college students who yeah. left because they have three different colleges. The other thing is, as a past pediatric provider, um, anecdotally, that it's not one hundred percent surprising to me. I said what? Surprising to me. Oh. Really? Okay, because of the attitudes about vaccination. Okay, oh. I would have thought that would have been just as strong as Nor in, in Northampton, though. So that's, I guess, what surprises me. And you're t you're saying that's not true. Okay, thanks for that information. There might have been a shift since I looked at it last, but, and then Williamsburg doesn't have any um, rate at all, 0%. But I, I don't, I just don't think it's being counted for some reason. Yeah. They, their zip code might be in with ours or something like that, because that's how they're reporting it. The last There's definitely I people who've had shots because I'm vaccinated. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. That's interesting. I'm just thinking about the last time I looked at that data because I would have to pull together a little report to do a little comparison. Yeah, we'll look at that. It's coming out again tonight. We'll look at it and just it's kind of out. follow up in an email and let you know what we see. Because um, some of the data is incomplete too, which I did know when I was reporting um, sure. this data here. Some of it's just incomplete. Um, they don't have a good tally or the population is too small. Sure. There's a lot of reasons for it. So it's hard to get a good full picture sometimes. It may be and better data collection <laughs> rather than vaccination rates, but I don't know. And how about um, the Amherst um, Department of Health? Are they doing outreach as well um, like you guys have on the road? They're actually the ones who start, uh, they, they were, um, they offered to do the homebounds instead of all in all, in all of Hampshire County, instead of us using the state, um, which was fantastic. So they took the lead on that. And I know they've been working with Dr. Bossy also and doing pop-up clinics. But they're not responsible or they're not, um, looking to vaccinate the students. The, the university is going to do the students. The university, yeah. And the university is still holding clinics three days a week, and they're averaging about 200 every clinic. Mm -hmm. So they're still holding pretty strong. Yeah, I wonder if um, the students got their first vaccine or didn't and then went home but still had their address as Amherst. It's probably some data collection issues there. Well, thank you so much. That is just amazing, amazing work. You guys have really um, just stepped up to the plate for, for our residents and uh, on our behalf and, and um, just really fabulous. It's really astounding. Thank you for all you've done. It was pretty awesome seeing it in print. Like I knew the numbers, I report them to my emergency management team every single week, but to see them in the presentation, where you've been, our vaccination rates and having it all put together is really wonderful. And kudos you guys for all the work that you do for us in the city. Definitely, thank you. Thank all of you. I saw you all at the clinic. <laughs> I mean, we keep talking around here about like the, the teamwork that this took and the, you know, how I, I don't even can't even imagine how many volunteer hours we had because I couldn't even imagine how many hours I was working at different points in time. So it's been a really neat, a really neat thing, right? Like so many different organizations, so many different people, some of the volunteers were like sad leaving today. So yeah, we're actually tallying those hours just to let you know. <laughs> um, yeah, um, because we're going to have a volunteer appreciation, some type of celebration. Um, and it's funny because I know Jack on the non-medical side has put in over 250 hours at the clinic. Like, that's just amazing to me. People, I know people Barbara wanted, Jones, huh? People wanted to help, oh, which yeah. I think reflects both the community and what you were doing. Mm -hmm. People want to get on board mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a testimonial to how uh, so many people told me how astounded they were when they went for their their vaccination appointment they said oh my 
God, they've got this thing created. It's amazing. And, and also people uh, compared it to other places where they had been with perhaps a relative. Somebody says, oh man, you know, the other places, not anything like Northampton. And so it was seen as a quality operation and people wanted to help. So it was, it was more than just that you did it, it was how you did it and how it, it was just remarkable to everyone that, that set foot within those, those doors. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody, any other comments? It's just amazing, amazing. It will sink in as time goes by. <laughs> and it'll be, I mean, even for, for me, I know, like I look, think back to March and April of last year, it's a blur, it's a total mm -hmm. blur. But, mm -hmm. you know, the difference between life coming and life a year ago, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll sink in later. But you guys have really stepped up to the plate in amazing ways. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Viv and Kate, for taking the time tonight. And I know you guys are awfully busy and this was totally appreciated and thank you for all your good work. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for hiring us. Great. <laughs> Happy to see you again. <laughs> all right. Happy to talk about data. <laughs> all right. Thanks guys. Talk thank to you tomorrow. Bye. All right, um, shall we look at the minutes? I know Lauren had uh, comments on the minutes and I could not tell what was new and what was old? Oh, I can um, tell you real quick. Yeah. Um, let me open the file. I, I just, uh, at the first paragraph uh, on comment, I just changed the, the, first, the, the sentence went, uh, there were also comments regarding mm -hmm. the health state of emergency imposed in the city. And I changed that to, there was also a comment regarding the continued COVID-19 related public health emergency. Um, that was one. And then the second edit I had was uh, at um, section three, paragraph A uh, about Christopher Craig. Uh, the sentence went, in Northampton opt out, the city would be liable for spraying uh, services if a severe outbreak occurs. And I changed that to if Northampton opts out, the city would be responsible for paying for and implementing spraying if a severe outbreak occurs. So it's, it's just fairly minor. And then I capitalized Massachusetts. There we go. That's it. <laughs> okay. Any other comments about the minutes? Thank you so much, Cynthia, for. Oh, wait, Susan is speaking, but she's on mute. Can you unmute your uh, Yeah, I, I communicated with Kelly. At the bottom, it says that the meeting was held in the hearing room on the second oh. floor. Um, <laughs> and, and she's going to change that to Zoom. And I have changed that. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Speaking, Any of, other? Which, speaking mm -hmm. of which, when are we going to resume meeting face to face? Um, and, at the Good earliest, question. the fall. Um, <laughs> I, there's more, so the consensus is, I mean, not just in Northampton, but overall in the state of Massachusetts, um, it's more inclusive having Zoom meetings, more people attend city council, um, whatever um, meetings that there are. So we'll have to think about how we move forward, but I do know that the legislation passed and the governor was supposed to uh, vote, um, officially sign it yesterday or the day before. I've got my days mixed up. But anyways, I think it's indefinite that you could do this moving forward. I wonder if um, if anyone's really looked, if the number of people might have increased at meetings, but there are certain populations that might still want to meet in person. Mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. when we met over JFK, there were people who were upset because they couldn't get there, but they could get downtown, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of... Mm -hmm certain groups. So uh, we might want to do a, a, you know, a hybrid of a hybrid, mm -hmm. you know, meet sometimes in person, meet sometimes on Zoom. Yeah. Um, I do, um, my impression is that our meeting room does not have central air. Is that true? I think. The the hearing room? No, yeah. it has a window air conditioning. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, from my personal perspective, Zoom is a lot easier. Uh, so I don't have to try to get to, to City Hall uh, and leave work. Um, I, I, I still can't finish work by the time I have to participate in these meetings, but without that commute, it makes it somewhat easier for me. Mm -hmm. We could also consider changing the time if that, you know. Well, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I think that's less fair for the folks who are working in the department and have to stay for these meetings. Mm -hmm. um, any other comments about the minutes? No, that, that's it for me. Um, does anyone want to make a motion? Move to approve. With the edits as presented. The uh, edits as mentioned. Anybody else? Second. All in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? Yes. And Joanne, yes. Okay. Um, what else do we have on our agenda? Where is my agenda? I would like to celebrate some numbers that I want to give out to you right now. In the past 14 days, we've had zero COVID-19 cases. Our percent positivity is zero, our daily incident rate is zero, and our 14 day incident rate is zero. Woo! Like, woo! <laughs> High five to that. Amazing. Yep. Um, I'll have to say that when Tony Fauci or the CDC had said that vaccinated people can just take off their masks and not worry about it and gather indoors, I was skeptical. And I'm so pleased that time has gone by and myself and others have gathered and it works. Mm -hmm. I'm just amazed. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean it works. Doesn't mean it works a hundred percent. There are people who are still still get sick. But at Cooley also we've had long stretches in the last few weeks without any COVID patients. Um, but we have had a couple. Um, so mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. Boy. Be awesome. We for a long time, we thought we'd never get there. Mm -hmm. It seemed impossible. Mm -hmm. Agree. It's true, I agree with you. It's pretty out of the blue when CDC says one day, you can go out, you can forget the mask, it's fine. <laughs> it was, and people just did not believe it. I have to say, I'm still a little bit in disbelief when I go to a grocery store and I'm still a little sheepish about taking it off. <laughs> I feel yeah. when I go to stores and go to indoor places. Yeah, yeah I, I wear it indoors. I, I do too, but I think everyone thinks that I'm not vaccinated and that's why I'm wearing it. <laughs> so now I carry this guilt trip. <laughs> Just tell them I have an immune deficiency. <laughs> and, you know, as we age, our immune system gets weaker. So we all sort of have an immune deficiency in a way. But I can also imagine wearing this permanently. If I take, if I ever go and take the plane again, or if I take public transportation, it almost makes sense in a way. Uh, I'm a person that has pretty severe allergies, and I, like a lot of people, have found that our allergies are better wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. And I intend to wear it next year in flu season. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say it would be very interesting to see what happens with in flu season. Uh, if people are not wearing masks. And, and it'd be interesting that it will be more socially acceptable to wear a mask and to clean your hands. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to see who sort of takes that up again in flu season because the same, basically same rules will apply. Yeah, yeah. Uh, rules of transmission. Um, okay, uh, Meredith, did you have any other updates? So the um, posting for the Board of Health member went live um, advertisement. We put it on the city website. I think Kel put it on our website also. I do know we've had one person submit a letter of interest to the mayor. Um, we're hoping it gets um, distributed a little more and we get more people that apply for the open position. So just wanted to let you know about that. Um, we, yep, go ahead. Um, I just was wondering about it because that person contacted me. And so um, it seems like it's a black hole in the sense like they don't know, 
they got the confirmation, but are we waiting for more applications or are we waiting for a new mayor? Or I just don't know what to tell that person. So we, this just went live, I want to say in the last 10 days, maybe 14 max, Cynthia. So we want to give it an opportunity to really get out there. Okay. But we're waiting for more applications for certain. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's actually not up to us, right? It's the mayor. Yeah, it's up to the mayor. He appoints them. But um, the person who applied actually applied probably closer to a month ago, pre this going, uh, yeah. the, um, yeah, the job description going out again. And I was thinking that, um, I mean, this job description, this opening has been open for what, over a year or whatever, a year and a half <clears throat> or more. Um, I was thinking um, whether we should put out our press release, talk to the Gazette, sort of promote it in some way. Would you guys be okay if uh, Mary Arthur I did that? Sure. Sure. Of course. Okay. Um, Meredith, anything else? Um, well, city council is doing the second reading of the budget tonight, so I don't anticipate any problems. I feel like I could have probably asked for the moon and they would have approved it at that <laughs> hearing that I went to. Um, I just wanted to share with you, we're in the process of hiring many people. Um, let me share my screen with you and restructuring a little bit. Ooh, hold on one second, I'm sorry. My session ended. Can you see what I'm doing right now? Is that yes. sure? Okay, <laughs> sorry. I've lost my Zoom. Uh, we can see that. You can see that? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I so we have um, I think we have in total in the health department right now 10 grants that we're working. And during COVID, I got behind a little bit in my reporting. Um, and I realized probably before COVID, but never said the words out loud that I needed a grant manager to help me with this. Um, so, and we needed what, what COVID brought to the surface was cherry. I had supervision already happening in my prevention team, but it wasn't acknowledged. It wasn't compensated. So what I did for this budget was I actually structured, restructured my prevention team. And it's, it's officially called now the center for prevention and community engagement. And I've given my team new titles along with an, a significant increase in pay for all of the responsibilities that um, I don't want to say take on because they've been primarily doing this for the past year and a half. Um, and I just wanted to kind of introduce to you what this looks like. So you all know Cherry. Um, she's been with me since the first grant that we got, which was the BSAS MOPSI grant. And that was for five years, which actually June 30th is the end of this grant. So we've been doing this prevention work for five years now. She's going to supervise the entire team in essence um, for me and will report directly to me. And then, um, you know, Michelle Fari, she's been to one of one or two of our meetings to talk about our work. And she was primarily focused um, on the DART work and growing that program in Hampshire County. And now we've since expanded it to Hamden and Berkshire County with these new grants that we got. And we've also um, created this amazing health in information exchange database, which started off with a 100,000 compact, community compact grant which now has been assessed at or valued at $4.9 million. And um, there's probably 50 plus agencies that are tapped into our HIE across Western Massachusetts. Um, so anyways, that's gonna be her primary job is overseeing those two programs. And Austin has been with us. He started during COVID. Wendy Penner is going to be our DART coordinator who's going to take on the expansion of the DART work in Hamden and Berkshire County. That's gonna be her primary job. She started on June 7th. Um, then our technology 
going to be Melissa Alosi, I believe is how I pronounce her name. And she starts on July 14th. And then um, we're having a contractor position who is Nate and he worked for us in this Tim position before. Um, he's gonna help with the transition to get her kind of onboarded. We've recently hired a grants manager, Catherine Moscos. She starts on Monday, which is fantastic. And then we are in the process right now of interviewing for uh, the NPC coordinator because the mayor put this in our budget because the, D, uh, the uh, DCF grant funding has ended completely and the city of Northampton can't apply for it. And then we have Kyle Engel who does our OD, OD, OD2A work and she's a contractor. So I just kind of wanted to give you an overview of what this division looks like. We're also right now I start the interviewing process for our assistant director on uh, June 23rd. I'm hiring three people who are qualified. One of them is an internal candidate, um, which I'll talk to you guys about later um, and let you know how that goes. And then we should kind of be set for right mm -hmm. now. We have written two grants over the last two months that we're waiting to hear about funding. And if we get the new SAMHSA grant, which I, pretty sure we will because we have been recognized for our work nationally. We're going to hire a Hampshire Hope coordinator out of that money. And then additionally, we have just been recently awarded, and I think I mentioned this to you at our last meeting, um, one of the SAFE grants, the Public Health Excellence Grants for um, shared services or regionalization. And what we're going to do with that money is we're actually going to support public health nursing services for all of the communities in Hampshire County. So I'll be hiring two um, FTE public health nurses, but as contractors to work for all of the communities in the county. And we'll be actually expanding our HIE. So every community in Hampshire County, their MAVEN data, it speaks to our database. So that'll be quite interesting how that works. And that's a three-year grant, $300,000 a year with two extra three-year terms to renew. So it could be nine years that we're doing this. And as we know, I mean, public health nursing in all of our smaller communities is almost non-existent. They didn't have anything pre-COVID. They might have um, hired someone with the CARES money, but that ends June 30th. So they're going to be in the same boat unless they actually, you know, develop their infrastructure for this. Um, so I'm hoping this is helpful. Uh, where did the, the nurses fit under that, Meredith? Our nurses, they're under our department. So this is just grant okay. funded positions right here. Okay. Our departmental budget is different, but they're both on my PNS full time. Okay. I, and I'm sorry, NPC is? Northampton Prevention Coalition. Thank you. Yeah. Meredith, um, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I'm gonna just like have my ignorance put out here. That is amazing and a lot of stuff and I don't know what a lot of it means. And so I'm wondering if at some point, not now, mm -hmm. um, I saw a lot of data, a lot of data analysis. So that tells me we're gathering data to make better health decisions. Mm -hmm. And I just have no idea what that is. And I'm not questioning it, but yeah. at some point, if you could just walk us through this. I, it would be so helpful because this is big. This is uh -huh. really huge. Yes. So I appreciate it. We'll invite Austin to come and present to you on the HIE. He's the one who runs our HIE right now. Um, he, he's doing all the regional work and he's actually part of the um, Public Health Excellence Grant, the SAFE grant, that's going to help us get Maven talking to our HIE so we can look at county trends in terms of infectious disease. Right now, Cynthia, all we have access to is the city of Northampton infectious disease data. I have no idea what's going on in East Hampton, Williamsburg, Hatfield, unless I pick up the phone and call the nurse and or the director or agent who's ever there or a board member, whoever has Maven access, and I ask them for some type of information. Otherwise, we just kind of were running blind. And it's so important to have larger data sets so we know what 
is happening right now in real time. So that's what that, that expansion is going to allow, which is really important. The database itself was built for the opioid overdose response teams to feed into it. I mean, that was our vision, right, originally, and it just got legs. I mean, there's so, there's so much capacity with this database, and I can't do it any justice. I don't speak the language. When, when the guys talk to me, it's right over my legs, and I'm like, pretend I'm a kindergartner. Like, just mm -hmm. talk to me that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, but this database is so big and so thought out that the CDC pre-COVID was actually supposed to come and visit us in February when COVID hit to look and learn about our database. We've been recognized um, on a national level many times over. So Meredith, did, did who created this database? So that was one question is, I mean, is this a local homegrown thing or is yep. this uh, a standard thing that we had the money to access? And the second is all these grants, um, I know not all of them, but are, 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 are this one in particular in, in looking at Hampshire County data and getting sort of the cities and towns to talk to each other. Is that something that is accessible to other counties in Massachusetts? I mean, is it coming to you or is it something you sought out and you had wrote a grant and you got it to happen? I sought it out, wrote a grant. My vision was this big compared to what the project is now. It was two simple things, data in, data out, you know? Um, we had data sharing agreements with our partners, business agreements with our partners. And um, we, we hired a company, a local company called Ready EDI to build this small little database. But, you know, it was a $100,000 compact grant that we got and we just kept on adding onto it. And we would seek out money wherever we could to do the build outs so more partners could actually get information out of the database. So it just it just took off. I mean- And then to connect it to Maven, how, did, how were you able to do that? We haven't yet. That's our new project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the company that did the work obviously saw where this was going and it was is going to put them on the map. They've been nationally recognized because of it. So they've they've given a lot of in kind effort to this project just because they knew you know where it was going. The vision of this. Mm -hmm. um, back to your org chart. Where are you going to put all these bodies? <laughs> ah, <laughs> so we're in the process right now um, of kind of figuring out what we're doing with everyone. So my nurses are very comfy in Memorial Hall, um, which is across from the hu Human Resource Department. They have a nice office suite up there. Um, in our main office, we will have myself, we will have Kelly, we'll have my assistant director, and we're going to have the grants manager sitting there, and then we're going to have an intern desk. So that's pretty much all we can do in that main okay. office. Then in the original nurse's office, which became the prevention office, is now going to be the inspector's office. So my inspectors are going to go into that office that's just a little bit down the hall on the same floor. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> and then we're hoping to secure a space, which I can't speak out loud right now because it isn't official yet, but it's in the works, um, in the same building. So my six to eight prevention people can be housed there. Wow. We have a monopoly going. Congratulations. So, <laughs> so at some time, if we could have another presentation, that would be great. <laughs> Absolutely, I'll put them Thank on you. the agenda for September. And Thank it'll you. be great because I'll have my new hires too and they too can come to the Board of Health meeting and I can make introductions and they can get a nice introduction to the HIE too. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. In the meantime, I can send you actually, this would be great. I can send you the presentation that we did for NACHO um, because NACHO, I don't know if you remember, started, uh, oh, Kelly could probably tell you better. It started the year before COVID and ended halfway in COVID. So we didn't get to finish the work that we initially applied for. What is NHO again? 
uh, National Association. City uh, and County Health Organizations. Thank you. City or, yeah. Health officials. Health, health officials. officials. We um, wrote a grant to mentor three local communities and then two county health departments out in Western, in the Western part of the state. Western, yes, Western part, Cal uh, Oregon and California. I can't remember oh, yeah. where, but anyways, because COVID hit, we weren't able to do that, but we still ended up presenting virtually how we expanded the HIE and the work that we were able to do with our local health departments. So I can send you that and it'll give you a, a great introduction and maybe we'll start the, the thought process on questions to ask when, when Austin comes. I'm glad you're gonna have something to do now that you have no COVID cases. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of what you're gonna do, Meredith is gonna take a fair bit of time off. <laughs> yes. Um, so that brings up the question of our calendar. We have so sort of basically the third Thursday of the month um, on the tentative calendar, uh, but there is a proposal not to have all those meetings. Uh, traditionally in the summer, we've usually had one over the July and August. Um, do we wanna do that? Do we wanna have none? Do we wanna meet up in September? I think that would make Meredith happy. Um, thoughts? Unless there's a compelling reason, I think the folks in our health department have worked awfully hard and they're the ones that have to do all the work to prepare for these meetings. So if it works, if we're not missing any compelling issues, uh, I say, let's meet in September. Sounds good to me. Thank you. So if we need to call a meeting, we will have a virtual meeting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that'll be a lot easier. People can come from yep. wherever. Um, but otherwise our next meeting would be- September 16th. Mm, which is a Jewish holiday. Um, how about September 23rd? That works. Or the 9th. Um, the ninth would be better for me, but um, I don't want to. I, I may be gone the twenty third, but ninth. I believe the ninth works. I don't have my calendar right in front of me, but uh, um, I believe that that works. Meredith, I believe that works for me. All right, so we're tentative for the ninth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, Joanne, thanks for changing that. The sixteenth wasn't going to be easy for me either. Okay. Even though it wasn't my holiday. Okay. Um, all right, uh, is there anything, any other comments? Anything else going on? Have a wonderful trip, <laughs> vacation, <laughs> grand, grandchild. Thank you. So <laughs> we're, we're pretty pretty informed much. about what happened. I know, I know. So, um, the, the 17th, which is a Saturday, will start my time off. Um, and I'll be gone two, three, four, five weeks. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I told the mayor, I said, um, don't plan on seeing me at least until September. I'll be available. I'll do a few hours here and there, whatever. Um, he's totally, he totally gets it. I need to get my house in order and digest, decompress and yeah. Enjoy some time. Well, that's good and well deserved. So. <laughs> Thank you. How'd you do that, Cynthia? <laughs> the wonders of Zoom. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an old maid. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> You've been doing way too much Zoom if you know how to do that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, especially Meredith and your staff for the amazing, amazing work. Uh, enjoy your well-deserved time off. Um, and um, we'll meet over the summer if we need to, if there's something pressing. Otherwise, we'll meet on September 9th. Well, I hope um, to see you all at the um, volunteer 
celebration that we're going to have. We're going to do that before I leave for vacation um, at the senior center. So I'll would you let make sure you let us know when? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. What's the date. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, when, do you know when the senior center is going to open? Not until the fall. Okay. They're going to do some renovation work oh. um, after we officially are out of there and then open up brand new. Okay. Um, if there's no other business, anybody want to make a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Yes. Roll call. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you all. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Meredith. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank guys. you. Have a great Thank night. You. Bye -bye. See you at the gathering. All right.